RPA Ultra, a modern approach to determine, to, to determine steady shear viscosity and wall slip of rubber compounds. This question will be given by Mr. Henry Brahim. Uh, let me introduce to you all. Probably many of you know him already. He's a world-renowned, well-experienced rubber rheology specialist and expert. Uh, probably close to 45 to 50 years of experience. Henry, is it right? That is correct. So let me briefly to now introduce to you to all of them once again. Um, you know, so he's a very young man in the rubber rheology with the close to 50 years experience. Okay, so that's how I want to introduce. He's still helping a lot of companies in you know in terms of rheological issues and currently is working as a consultant for the Barais in uh, related to the RPA Ultra as well. Um, so background about Henry is he retired from Alpha Technologies and uh, formerly it is called Monsanto Instrument Equipment. His career in Monsanto, Flexis, and Alpha Technologies was all 39 years long. It, uh, Monsanto, he supported the sales of national of the modern rubber testing instruments with a special emphasis on the rheological tools. He also participated in the latest development on the RPA 2000 instrument towards higher productivity, sensitivity, and accuracy, and also novelty. He acquired wide experience in the nonlinear viscoelasticity, elasticity, also called as the FT rheology or Laos. He has been working in post coverage with the universities as well in Belgium, and he holds two patents and several papers and has been a speaker at several international conferences across the world. Since 2012, he's, a, he's been working as a consultant on the rubber rheology and technolo technology consultant and also teaching the rheology classes across the world. So that's a briefly about uh, Henry. As you see, he's well experienced in the rheology, and he'll be making a presentation on the RPA Ultra, a modern approach to determine steady shear viscosity and wall slip of rubber compounds. So let's welcome Henry to make a presentation. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Param, for this uh, nice uh, introduction. I will uh, talk about uh, the steady shear viscosity. I'm not going to repeat what Mr. Rauschmann explained, but I'm going to compare the steady shear viscosity on the RPA Ultra with capillary rheometer, which is the standard machine to measure that kind of property. But we will concentrate especially on wall, st wall slip of rubber compound during processing. So um in rubber compound processing rubber compound is often analyzed now uh, especially processing uh, either injection molding or extrusion by modern flow simulation computer application there are several uh, computer application which exist uh, to predict what is going to be the um, uh, behavior of uh, the compound in real processing the prediction of injection molding parameters, extrusion output and shape require normally a precise knowledge of material flow properties. This implies that the measurement of true viscosity, but real true viscosity and correct viscosity as a function of shear rate and temperature. We have seen that uh, dynamic viscosity is not an option uh, and we need to go to steady shear viscosity. Now, the measurement of true viscosity is somewhat difficult to apprehend, but it's a prerequisite for successful simulation. The most used instrument for measuring the rubber processing, uh, compound processing uh, characteristic is the capillary rheometer. The capillary rheometer is all over the place, and you can find uh, that in medium size to large size uh, rubber processor or rubber manufacturers. Uh, but less in small uh, company, because it's a difficult instrument to work with. This popular instrument is uh, giving some problem because it requires numerous correction involving multiple tests before providing true or corrected viscosity of the material of interest. 
So by the use of a closed boundary biconical rheometer, an RPA actually, and the RPA Ultra, it can be in, an interesting alternative to measure two capillary rheometer for the measurement of steady flow viscosity and wall slip. So I just want to go briefly into the capillary rheometer and the principal correction and some flaws in the, the, the system. So you can recognize in this case the graph of a capillary rheometer which consists of a barrel and a piston. Your material is in the, the machine and the material is pushed by the piston through a die of a given length and diameter. In green, you have your measurement of your pressure. All the capillary rheometer, the principle is based on the hagen poiseuil equation for Newtonian fluid. Now, it's interesting to remember that actually Mr. Poiseuil was a doctor and he was interested in the flow of blood in uh, bodies of people and blood vessels. Also, the equation is based on Newtonian fluid. And we know that rubber compounds are not Newtonian fluids. So in order to get proper uh, values of viscosity, this instrument uh, measurement needs to be corrected. The first correction is an entrance pressure drop. You can see in the graph here that there is a small difference in pressure because the pressure sensor is a little bit higher than the entrance of the die. So this little error needs to be corrected and it's named uh, the Bagley correction. And this is <clears throat> actually uh, correcting shear stress. Then we have to take into account the fact that the material is non-Newtonian. And in order to um, get the correction, it's called the Rabinovich correction, which is going to correct the shear rate for true shear rate. Now, when looking at uh, reference books, we're going to see another conditions which are very little studied. The first one is the proper measurement as seen after correction of Bagley and Rabinovich is assuming no wall slip. Now, that is of course sometimes the case or sometimes not the case depending on the compound formulation. That's the viscous eating during the test is negligible. Now, that of course depends on the uh, shear rate which is applied, and we're going to see an example. There is another assumption that the material is not, the viscosity is not dependent upon pressure. Now, this can vary from compound to compound, polymer to polymer, because it exists in this material uh, some free volume which will be reduced in case of high. Uh, pressure and therefore viscosity will change. And there is uh, a third, uh, a fourth one, which is the shear history and the possible uh, material thixotropy. Now you understand that in a capillary rheometer, the material is pushed through the die with a piston without any shear, although in an extruder it's done with a screw. So the thixotropy. Uh, nature of the material will be different between uh, the two. We will not study too much or will not cover too much the pressure dependency of viscosity and the thixotropy in this presentation. There is <clears throat> one flaw in the um, in the capillary rheometer test is that the stress depends on the pressure which is measured. So when you vary the, uh, the speed of your pistons, you actually increase your shear rate, but your pressure is uh, different and the pressure in the die is actually decreasing. So essentially, the, uh, the material property is measured at variable pressure, which has therefore changed into a shear stress. And if there is a pressure dependency and if wall slip is changing depending on pressure, this will have a detrimental effect and the capillary rheometer is not very good in that case. <clears throat> so very quickly, I wish to present the Bagley correction. 
and there's this is uh, here an interesting um, an interesting example. First of all, as I explained, the stress is calculated based on the different pressure between the entrance of the die and the exit of the die. This for the calculation of stress is divided by a geometrical factor which depends on the ratio of the lens over the radius of the die. But as I explained, there is a small error, so the Bagley correction needs to remove actually what is the entrance pressure drop from uh, the delta pressure from the inside to the ex exit. And this can be done by what is called uh, plotting a Bagley plot, plotting pressure as a function of L over D. So you can see in this case that three tests needs to be uh, to be to be tested, to be performed, and by uh, doing a linear uh, regression, we can calculate what is going to be as the intercept the P0, which uh, is used for the Bagley correction. Now, in this example, we can see that uh, actually when we increase shear rate, the, um, the graph is not any more linear and has a curvature. So in that case, uh, this effect is given by the compressibility effect of the material. So in that case, we use a second order uh, regression and by uh, doing the regression, this is going to calculate the uh, value of the intercept as the P0. So with the Bagley plot, we know already if we have some compressibility uh, effect. Then what do we have to do now to correct uh, shear, stress, uh, shear rate? To do that, we performed what is known as the Raminovich correction. In a capillary rheometer, the shear rate is given uh, from uh, the output of the material uh, at a given speed. So it's equal to four times the output divided by the um, uh, pi over r cube. But this is only for Newtonian material. Now, the um, Rabinovich correction actually is going to be given by multiplying the calculated apparent shear rate by a factor which depends on a factor n, 3 times n plus 1 divided by uh, 4n. And n actually is the slope of the log shear, shear stress as a function of log shear rate. Uh, in this case, we can see a small curvature, so we can make a, a second order regression. We can see that the curvature is small because the parameter for the x square is very small. And we can take the derivative of this function and we can calculate an n value for each given shear rate, which will then correct um, the shear rate. Once we have the corrected shear stress from Bagley and the corrected shear uh, rate from uh, Ravinovich, the ratio will give us the corrected uh, viscosity. This is the normal viscosity you apply in flow simulation software. But we are missing uh, indeed one parameter. If the compound is actually slipping in the dye, in the capillary, but also in the extrusion uh, head, for instance. Before going to uh, the measurement of slip, uh, there is one little point to add, uh, is the shear heating. Uh, shear heating, we can see here in the case of capillary rheometer in a given compound, we can see that up to 100 reciprocal second, there is hardly any increase of temperature. But as soon as we um, uh, increase uh, the shear rate above 100, we have a very strong increase of temperature, showing that the test is done in the non-isothermal uh, conditions, which is, of course, affecting the results and the reliability of the result. This effect will be present in all 
uh, testing uh, processability of rubber. So whatever the machine you use, you're going to have that problem. And it is, of course, a uh, present in, a, for instance, variable speed Mooney. So if you, for instance, apply a 20 RPM variable speed Mooney on a compound for five or 10 minutes, there's for sure you're going to burn the the material by uh, shear heating. So we will require a method which will reduce as much as possible the shear heating by doing extremely short test time at high shear rate. And this can be done with the RPA Ultra in steady shear. So now let's go to wall sleep, which is the major subject of this uh, presentation. Um, the uh, wall slip correction in the capillary areometer is based on a method developed by Mr. Mooney, the Mr. Mooney who developed the famous viscometer. <clears throat> so he claimed that in a capillary areometer, you have a total output, which is the sum of the output of the material in no slip conditions, so in real shear plus an output its slip condition. So uh, it's a simple equation, QT equal QNS plus Q uh, in uh, shear. Since the apparent shear rate is uh, given by the, um, uh, by uh, four times the output divided by the shape factor, we can replace each output by the value depending on the apparent uh, shear rate. So we're going to have something like this, which actually is easy for the uh, slip uh, output because it's simply the cross section of the die. So it's pi r cube multiplied by the slip velocity, which is the parameter we're looking for. So by simplification, we have uh, the apparent uh, shear rate equals the shear rate in no slip conditions plus four times the slip velocity divided by R. So by this is a linear function. So we can plot the apparent viscosity as a function of one over R. That implies two, preferably three tests. In the case in the graph, Four tests have been done, and we can uh, do a linear correlation because it's a linear function, and the intercept will be the uh, no slip shear rate, and the slope will be four times the slip velocity. There is one point which needs to be stressed, is that the Mooney method has been developed essentially with or for thermoplastic, not rubber compound. So when rubber scientists have tried to use the um, the Mooney method on rubber not for all compounds but for a very large number of compounds this is one example for instance uh, which has been published by a university in south of france it's a null extended sbr with standard carbon black using a capillary rheometer or a slit die rheometer and you can see that in both cases actually the method predict a negative no slip shear rate and this is undoubtedly a complete nonsense physical nonsense so for rubber compound the Mooney method is not reliable at all two other scientists geiger and vigreff propose another method to avoid predicting a negative uh, no slip shear rate uh, I'm not going to uh, explain in details, but basically Geiger using a uh, slit rheometer is uh, using an exponential rather than a linear. So uh, in that case, we can illustrate the comparison between a Mooney method and the Geiger method. And we can see that even in the case of a negative uh, predictable no slip shear rate it's never the case with the geiger method so that's an, a way to avoid um, predicting negative no slip shear rate for vigreff he used the same 
system as the Mooney, but instead of plotting as a function of one over R, it's plotting as uh, one over R square, uh, bringing uh, the same uh, uh, the same advantage of non uh, negative um, no slip shear rate. The problem, of course, is both approaches propose a dependency of slip velocity to geometrical factor. So it restrict the use for uh, computer software. So there was a need for a simpler method. But by the way, why bother about wall slip? Well, this is a very interesting uh, publication by ANSYS. ANSYS actually is selling a product uh, for flow simulation of rubber compound called polyflow. And they took the same, uh, the same compound and in the same dye, they apply no slip conditions and high slip conditions. And you can see very easily that actually the shape of the extrudate is totally different. We know that the viscoelastic properties is changing the, uh, the shape of your extrudate, but we can see that the uh, slip is also affecting a lot um, the shape of your extrudate. So we can see, for instance, in no slip conditions, uh, in the blue uh, graph, this is the shape of the extrudate or the cross section of the extrudate. And in 100 slip, uh, actually, your compound is having exactly the same uh, shape as your uh, die lip. So it comes to a the, the Navier law, which is the tension as to certain uh, shear rate, which depends uh, upon uh, the viscosity. The, the wall slip <coughs> to a parameter called the Navier slip coefficient. And we can see that in this case, this is a power law. So the challenge, as we have seen just before, is getting an accurate evaluation of wall slip. And this is difficult. We know the material is slipping, but we can hardly quantify how much. It's extremely important for rubber compound, but also, and I was a bit surprised, by uh, for um, PVC compound extrusion. So I'm just now going to cover a little bit the subject which has been presented by Mr. Rauschmann, the steady shear viscosity. There is other method for uh, other than a capillary rheometer, which is uh, steady shear on cone cone or uh, cone plate uh, rheometers. You have two machine, one which is very well known and used for steady shear called an open boundary DMA die design where the uh, cavity is actually open. What you do, you do a continuous rotation of the bottom plates and the torque measurement is on the top plate. The stress calculation as explained by Mr. Rauschmann is simply uh, three times the torque divided by two pi r cube and this is your true stress. Since you have a true um, um, and your shear rate in the case of cone, cone uh, geometries is your angular uh, velocity, omega, divided by your cone angle. So the ratio of these two will give you the viscosity. The problem of this design, if it works very well with low viscosity polyolefin, for instance, actually does not work for rubber compound or high viscosity material because during the rotation because the machine is open there will be a crack which will grow through the material and the measurement will always be in non-stationary condition with a closed boundary as the rpa uh, we use actually um, quite a uh, high pressure well, medium pressure, 50 to 60 bar internal pressure. We use groove dies, so we assure no slip. So by programming a step rain, we able to both measure transient viscosity at the beginning of the test and steady shear viscosity when stationary shear condition is reached. But we have to remember that within the same instrument, we can measure still oscillatory shear viscosity and steady shear viscosity on one single instrument, which makes the RPA Ultra one of the most versatile instruments. So 
what we can do, it's explained already from Mr. Rauschmann, we can apply different time for a given strain um, and we can calculate the shear rate as a function of the total deformation divided by the time used to reach that deformation. The ratio will give you the shear rate. And the response in this case is shear stress. The first part where the stress is not constant is the transient shear. We're not going to talk about that. But once you reach some uh, steady shear conditions, so uh, stationary conditions, you can take that value of stress divided by um, the shear rate, which will give you the viscosity. This is obtained on a polymer, but we can do that on an NRBR thread compound, which is a, uh, a production uh, thread compound. So it's not a uh, simple uh, compound. So what we can do here, we can measure the, uh, the viscosity at um, shear rate from 0 0.01 to 10 irreversible second, and we can compare the results with the capillary rheometer, the apparent viscosity and the corrected viscosity. And we can see that we have an excellent correlation. Um, we have to keep in mind that at a very low shear rate, the capillary, capillary rheometer is not very, very good, where the uh, RPA Ultra steady shear is excellent. And we can see that we can uh, predict at even higher shear rate. Now, the RPA Ultra with 500 reciprocal second can really apply uh, a shear rate which is going to cover almost all necessary shear rate for extrusion, for instance. So, how now to study wall slip with the RPA Ultra? The test method. Uh, we are using uh, takes the following conditions. First of all, we used grooved upper and lower dies, and that's going to be your no slip conditions. Then you replace the upper die by a grooveless mirror polish die, and it's very important that uh, that grooveless die is mirror polished. If it's not, it's not going to slip. Um, due to the high pressure in the RPA uh, die. And then, with the two conditions, you apply a steady shear test program with variable shear rate. You can even further test by variable closing force to vary the cavity pressure in order to measure the wall slip dependency of pressure. I have to say that we will not cover that point. It's uh, something which needs to be done, but it will uh, require a complete study. So just to illustrate um, uh, wall slip, if we take a, a Newtonian material, which is for instance an oil in this case, and we apply inside uh, the tube uh, blue lines using a, a die with a syringe, and we apply then a flow of the material, we're going to see that um, the, 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 the line will be deformed as a parabolic uh, form, which is quite normal, but we're going to see that actually at the wall, the blue line is exactly at the ejection point, so there's no slip. If we have slip with a Newtonian material, we're going still to have, depending on the shear rate, your parabolic uh, function with variable uh, wall slip. Now, <clears throat> if we take a drag flow, so for instance, a, a plate plate or cone plate, and using a similar uh, technique, we apply a, a black line and then we move the upper die which is going to slip somehow uh, so we're going to move towards the right what we're going to see is in the upper example there will be um, a slight uh, slip 
above and bottom, but there will be a velocity gradient. That means there is a mixture of wall slip and no slip. In case of totally wall slip, we're going to have what is called a plug flow, and the black line, which is across the material, will, will remain uh, vertical. So that has been uh, demonstrated by uh, some scientists uh, using, for instance, a, a high concentration suspension uh, in polymer. So <clears throat> when now we look at the effect of shear rate on slip velocity, using a high slip EPDM compound with this formulation, as you can see, it contains very large amount of filler and large amount of processing. It's a high slip EPDM compound. So in processing, it's known to slip a lot. So when we measure um, the range of shear rate in no slip conditions and slip condition, we can see that actually um, there is a, a viscosity much lower for uh, the slip condition, which is quite normal, but also it is there is an effect on the slope. Now, if we use another uh, material, which is the thread compound we've seen before, so it's 55 parts of N234 plus 10 parts, only 10 parts of processing oil, we can see immediately that actually it slips much less under the same condition. Also, um, we can see that the slope under uh, slip conditions is uh, different than in no slip condition. So we found in the, um, in the literature another, another method based on the Mooney slip velocity and using the same relation, but testing in slip and no slip condition exactly under the same conditions we're using on the RPA Ultra with groove dies and um, polished dies. So in this case, the slip velocity depends is the difference between the output in slip and the output in no slip condition divided by geometrical factor, depending upon the die. So the velocity of slip is equal to the apparent shear rate and the no slip shear rate multiply by the geometrical factor r over square over four but this approach implies that you know the output in no slip condition and this is exactly what the rpa ultra is giving so in this case what we need to do to do is at a given shear stress so at constant shear stress we measure the difference in shear rate so just to illustrate simply, in linear shear, a little bit like the uh, the mark on the drag flow we have seen for the uh, suspension, we move the upper die, which is the polished die, uh, towards the right direction at a given uh, speed. And if we mark the material, we may see actually that there is a velocity gradient, but the uh, gradient does not go to the maximum uh, apparent shear rate. That means that the difference between the two is actually the um, slip velocity which uh, you are, we are looking for. Of course, in this case, it's linear shear. In the RPA Ultra, we're using rotational uh, shear, but in this case, the angular velocity is equal to the angular velocity, apparent angular velocity, minus the angular velocity uh, without slip. Since the shear rate is given by the ratio of the angular velocity over the cone angle, we know that in our case, in the RPA Ultra, the angular velocity equals to alpha, which is the cone angle, multiplied by the difference in shear rate apparent shear rate, no uh, slip shear rate at constant shear stress. We can transform the angular velocity into linear viscosity elasticity by multiplying uh, by two pi at uh, the maximum radius. 
Now we use two approximation. First of all, we are based we based our analysis on the Ostwald Ostwal de Waal uh, for sliding and no sliding uh, parameter. Uh, and we know that actually um, the especially the no slip uh, results are more like an actual bulk clay, but for the sake of simplicity, we're using uh, the Oswald de Waal, which is better known as the power law uh, model. So we plot shear stress as a function of shear rate now uh, under slip conditions and no slip condition. And we analyze and we can see that there is a very strong decrease in slip condition for the PDM and much smaller for, uh, for the NRBR compound. Also something important, we can see that the N factor, the non uh, pseudoplasticity index, is much lower uh, for slip conditions. And that's a bit surprising because uh, <coughs> sorry, it's, um, in slip conditions is larger. And this is quite surprising because quite a lot of rubber rheologists tends to believe the opposite. In this case, we can see that applies very, very simply and very clearly for both high slip EPDM compound and the tread compound. So once we have that, what we can do um, is I just need to explain one more point. So at a given uh, shear stress, we actually measure the difference in shear rate across the full spectrum of the measurement. This multiplied by the cone angle will then give the, the slip velocity. And then we can plot slip velocity as a function of shear stress according to Navier uh, law, and we can see that experimentally the uh, slip velocity is indeed a power law with different slope between the two compounds. And we can see that the um, high slip EPDM compounds slip much, uh, much more than the um, uh, tread compound, NRBR tread compound. The, the table next to the graph uh, will give you what has been published in terms of slip velocity range uh, from Geiger, Mournia, Vigreff and others compared to our current publication, current uh, presentation. And we can see that we are totally in line with what they have been uh, uh, finding, although we have an extremely fast uh, measurement with the RPA Ultra. So with the PDM and thread compounds, we can now have a uh, calculation of the Navier slip coefficient. There is another point which is interesting, is the measurement of the slip ratio. The slip ratio is actually the slip velocity as calculated, divided by the apparent viscosity. So in that case, when we have a slip velocity which is equal to the apparent velocity, the material is actually 100% slipping. So the slip ratio will give you what is the percentage of slip versus no slip. So when it's close to one, as the high slip, vis uh, high slip EPDM compound, actually at low shear stress, the material is going through the die, actually 100% slipping, doesn't shear at all. So that is something interesting. And we can see that this high value of slip is around 30, uh, thousand pascal of shear stress. Now, when we are looking now at the viscosity of function of shear stress, we can then uh, look at a, um, a behavior which is known as a yield stress. And we can see that with grooved uh, geometries, actually the high slip EPDM compound due to the very high level of filler actually uh, react as a yield stress fluid and we can roughly calculate a critical stress where actually the uh, material will have almost an infinite viscosity. But if it has an infinite viscosity, it cannot deform. That means 
The only way it can go through a die is by slipping. And that was actually uh, demonstrated by this uh, scientist with the high concentration suspension. And we can see that above, sorry, below the yield stress of his material, the material flows, has a plug flow. So 100% slip. What is also interesting is that in slip conditions, you can see that you don't see that behavior. So the fact that people tend to believe there's no yield stress uh, in a rubber compound may not be due to the real nature of the material, but simply because of a flaw in the testing method, which may contain, contain some slippage. So now another compound, which is another uh, production compound, which is a little bit more complex, still quite a lot of fillers. And we compare now uh, four different ways to measure the viscosity. So we measure the viscosity with the APA Ultra in no slip condition, in slip conditions, and we compare the results with a Mooney, variable speed Mooney, but now using biconical rotor for um, steady deformation and shear rate across um, the, the rotor. And we can see that because the Mooney is using a high pressure cavity, it fits extremely well with the RPA Ultra. <coughs> and it comes very uh, close, almost equal to the capillary rheometer at high shear rate. So it's very simple that a RPA Ultra can measure very low um, shear rate uh, value in no slip conditions to even higher because we know from Mr. Rauschmann that the RPA Ultra can test up to 500 reciprocal second, which of course the biconical uh, rotor Mooney cannot do, even variable speed. But what is interesting is that the, um, the capillary rheometer, even after correction, not for uh, slip, actually is following the uh, response for viscosity in slip conditions in the RPA Ultra. So the only way to really have a good measurement of the property of your material, including the slip velocity, is using this kind of RPA Ultra with steady shear. So for this compound, we were really quite surprised because when we plotted the uh, shear, uh, the slip velocity as a function of shear stress, first of all, we can see that there is a linear relationship according to Navier, but the given um, at the given stress value, the slope, and it remains still a, a, a linear function, the slope changed totally and uh, the slip increases uh, more and we haven't found yet any explanation for this behavior. Also, the slip ratio in this material uh, is close to uh, 100%. Uh, meaning that uh, at very low shear stress, it can go through the extruder by only slip. <clears throat> the last uh, important parameter is the uh, dependency of viscosity for temperature. This is fundamental for flow simulation software. In this case, with an RPA Ultra, you, you only need to run one uh, steady shear test at one reciprocal second, for instance, at three different temperature. And we have done that for the NBR-SBR compound. And by plotting the uh, value of viscosity at one region per second, which is the K factor for the power law uh, model, we can plot that as a function of the inverse of the temperature in degree Kelvin. And we can see that we can achieve a very nice Arrhenius graph, giving the energy of activation of 17.6 kilojoule per mole or 4.2 kilocal per mole, which is perfectly in line with what uh, has been published in the literature. 
So the summary in conclusion, the RPA Ultra in steady shear tests is a very efficient and flexible tool to measure both transient and steady shear viscosity of rubber compound. The available shear rate covers a very from very low to medium or high shear rate, considering that we can reach 500 sec, uh, reciprocal second. What is really also interesting is that the very low shear rate can actually probably detect whether in no slip condition the material is indeed a yield stress material. It does not require lengthy correction, such as in the capillary rheometer. The very short test time at higher shear rate, it uh, very rarely uh, exceeds one second, reduces shear eating effect, which is a, a, an advantage over capillary rheometer. The comparison or the installation of a polished die with variable instrument cavity pressure of a, a unique uh, tool and an extremely simple combination to study wall slip in rubber processing if wall slip depends on pressure, but this is still to be studied. <clears throat> and it is the only available instrument to separate the shear stress, shear rate effect and pressure effect when measuring viscosity. So the RPA steady shear viscosity measurement, sleep no sleep, paves the way to a deeper understanding of rubber compound flow properties, therefore potentially improving flow simulation software. Thank you very much for your attention. I want to thank uh, the following uh, person, uh, Dominique Schramm, Sandy Predi, Salvatore Coppola, Inversalis, who has uh, done the biconical Variable uh, Speed Mooney and Patrick Ayer from Freudenberg for running the capillary rheometer. So thank you.